Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for session two of the Gift of Life Empowering Living Kidney Donation Series. Uh, all lines have been muted. Today's session, as you probably just heard, will be recorded, and there will be a copy of the slides, the recording, and then an accompanying handout that'll be available on the Quality Insights Network 5 website. There will be a time for questions at the conclusion of the presentation, and we would just ask that you would submit those questions down in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We did receive some questions during the registration process, um, and these are going to be addressed at the end or during the session that best aligns with that question. Um, our speaker today is Glenna Fry. She is a nephrology nurse and living kidney donor. She is the co-founder and executive director of Kidney Donor Conversations, a nonprofit organization that provides education and support for living kidney donation. Kidney Donor Conversations has a new animated video available that succinctly covers some of the topics from today's session. So please be on the lookout for a link to this video in the next eLERTS newsletter. This is session two, again, of four sessions. Each will build upon the prior, so it's helpful if you attend all four, or you can also watch the recording of the previous sessions that are, again, available on the Network 5 website. In the previous session, we discussed the challenges of kidney transplant in the country, and um, types of communication within the dialysis unit. This session will cover a more in-depth look at the spectrum of living kidney donor processes and ways to donor, donate. Lena will also cover details regarding voucher programs. The voucher program is frequently confused with paired donation, but they are different things. The voucher program can serve as a powerful tool for those considering donation. And we really hope that it will be a helpful tool for the staff in facilities who may be walking through the living donor process with their patients, potential donors, family, and friends. So after this session, Glenna, if you could um, advance the slides. Continuing education. This presentation has been approved for one uh, credit for social workers through ASWB. It will require that you watch the 60 minute webinar, either live or recorded, and also complete the evaluation and post test questions. We will make a link to that available to you at the end of this presentation in the chat. Um, you will also receive an email after this presentation with some of the links that we discussed today. So the learning objectives for today. After this session, you should be able to discuss the compre comprehensive medical, psychological, and social evaluations that are required for donation. You should be able to, in a general sense, describe voucher options to allow donors to donate um, a kidney for a loved one's future use, as well as explain the living donation process from initial inquiry to post-donation follow-up. And again, while we know that most of you are working with potential recipients, not necessarily the potential donors, we do hope that the insight into this side of the process provides a more comprehensive understanding that will inform your work with both patients and their families and hopefully increase your confidence in discussing living donation as an option, even in the absence of immediate family or friends who can donate. Next slide. So we're gonna start off today with a polling question. Please answer honestly, this is not a test, it's just a way to mark kind of where you're starting out with this presentation. What is your comfort level with discussing the process and options for living donors? Are you comfortable, somewhat comfortable, or not at all comfortable? And as you all are answering, I will turn things over to Glenna. Thank you. 
Um, honestly, I knew very little about living kidney donation process before I donated. Even as a dialysis nurse, I would not have been able to tell a patient or potential donor exactly what to expect. So I want to help you understand the process and options for donors without having to donate yourself. Although if you really are interested in donating, um, let me know, we can talk. So let's see if these results are in. It looks like most people are somewhat comfortable and um, a fewer number are not at all comfortable. So that's great that at least you've got some comfort level coming into this. And hopefully we can increase that um, as we go through the talk today too. My internet seems to be advancing these slides a little weird. So hopefully this will work out okay. So living kidney donors generally do go through a similar process, regardless of how they're donating. Um, based on my experience and talking with donors, I've identified eight living kidney donor stages. Transplant centers normally start seeing patients at stage four or five when they start the workup. Um, but I find that the process actually starts much earlier than that. First, the idea of donating is sparked. Most people will hear a story, maybe on YouTube, a TED talk, maybe a podcast, presentations like this social media, or family, or friends. Um, I talked to several people who donated before my donation, and each of them helped me to understand the process in some way. I had never heard a formal presentation like this before. So for people looking for a kidney, it's really important that they share their story because that's really what sparks the idea of donating. Sharing stories, about what it's like to be on dialysis every day or three times a week, or the lack of energy, the lack of participating in normal social activities, or the inability to work. Help others understand how a transplant can improve their quality of life. And the earlier, the better. I always say CKD stage four or before is when we should be talking about kidney transplant before starting dialysis. If someone's already on dialysis, the sooner the better. Potential donors need time to get used to the idea of donating. It may be years later that a donor steps forward. So telling these stories starts the stages. It's almost like the precursor to a donor thinking about the idea of donating. The next stage is quiet thinking. So you're quietly considering the idea of donating in, even before you tell anyone. Um, people might have concerns about being criticized or not supported or not knowing if there will be a match or even if they are healthy enough to donate. Um, they kind of just keep it to themselves until they get a little more comfortable with the idea. The third stage is exploring kidney donation. And something I wanna share is these stages, this is not necessarily the order everyone may have through the stages. And some people go through each stage very quickly, other people go very slowly. So some of these can take years or it could take a day or two. It really is variable depending on the person. So if we look at exploring kidney donation, it's kind of looking more in depth at benefits, the risk, the cost of donating, can you get time off work, what's the impact on your family, what's the benefit to the recipient, and maybe there's other donors going through the process too, so you know sometimes they're not sure who's going to be the best match, but, but you're interested and maybe curious at the beginning. Um, exploring can often be done on the internet, social media, books, or other donors and recipients and families. And information will also be provided later by the transplant centers during the donor workup. The initial screen is next. 
Um, and this can be done online in the comfort of your own home. You don't really even have to tell anyone, commit to anything, or even go to a transplant center yet. Most transplant centers on their website will have an initial screening questionnaire. In addition, we've tried to make it easy on the Kidney Donor Conversations website. On our homepage, we've got a link here that says, see if you can be a kidney donor. And I just like kind of sending their people there initially. They can do the initial health screening, see if they pass that. And if they do, they can be sent blood and urine information. And this um, technically goes to the National Kidney Registry site. Um, but again, I think it's nice because people don't have to make any commitments at this point. They can just kind of explore for themselves, um, might they be healthy enough to start the process. If all goes well, the next step is to select a transplant center and start the full in-person workup. So what does that look like? I had 23 tubes of blood drawn initially. They checked for blood type, tissue typing, electrolytes, CBC, liver function, diabetes, including a fasting glucose, oral glucose tolerance test, hemoglobin A1C. Um, I had a 24 hour ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. And just a side note about blood pressure is some centers will allow people to be on one or two blood pressure medications if they're very well controlled. So don't think that um, that would rule them out if they happen to be on a blood pressure med. They're also gonna look at kidney function. Uh, usually a CT or an MRI will, will look at the kidney structure and the vessels. You can't have any blood or protein in the urine. They'll look at the GFR. Um, they could do it using a filtration marker and collecting urine and blood. They'll probably do at least a 24 hour urine and probably more than one. And just a side note, and this sounds so bizarre, but as a nurse, I've done lots of 24 hour urines um, when I worked in a transplant center. And I was the most, this was the most nervous I was of all the testing I had done as a donor. I was most worried about the 24 hour urine because you know, we have to use those little hats and I was afraid I would miss it. Um, and I wanted to make sure it was only urine. And then you have to pour it in those jugs and I was afraid I might spill it. And then you have to refrigerate it. So I, I figured out that I couldn't do it on a work day because I really didn't want, you know, this 24 urine sitting in our food refrigerator at work. So it ended up being way more stressful of a test than I had ever expected. They will look at the heart function with an EKG. I had an additional echocardiogram and a cardiology consult because I had some abnormal uh, changes on my EKG that ended up being fine. They'll look at hyperlipidemia, rule out any infections, HIV, hepatitis C, hepatitis B, tuberculosis, COVID now. And cancer screening, which would be normal cancer screening for your age and sex. So it could be a mammogram, it could be a colonoscopy, um, or you might not have anything, again, depending on how old you are. Um, I also had a dermatology exam because I had, was fair skinned and I had some moles, but again, that turned out fine. You can't be pregnant. And um, they normally recommend that you wait about a year before getting pregnant after you donate. So just a reminder, additional testing is really common. So um, some potential donors kind of get worked up over additional testing, but that's very normal. They just wanna make sure that the donor is healthy. There is a psychosocial evaluation. It may be done by social worker, psychologist, or a group, and I had I don't know, there was at least five people in my in the room when I were asking me questions like, why do you want to donate? Uh, what does your family think about it? Who will help you after surgery? What if the kidney doesn't work? What if the recipient dies? Um, there were some things that I had really never thought about. Um, well, 
At least I didn't, but maybe as a social worker, you think of those things. So the next stage is surgery. Um, just reminder that the potential donor and donor team must both say yes to schedule the surgery. The donor can back out any time before surgery and the team will consider them not acceptable to donate and they will not need to give any details to the potential recipient. They will just say they're no longer a good donor. Typically, there's gonna be a pre-op visit about a week before with final blood work and assessment. Some donors have a bowel prep the night before, it kinda of depends on the surgeon. Surgery itself is around four hours and they'll do post-op recovery in the recovery room, just pretty typical post-op stay, and then in a hospital room after that. Most incisions are done laparoscopic, and some may be open if necessary. <clears throat> so you'll come back with your incision, dressing, an IV, oxygen, a Foley. They will be monitoring the urine output probably for the next day. Um, I had a PCA pump with IV pain med. A heating pad for comfort was very important. Um, a lot of people have abdominal binders also just for support. And typically you're gonna be on a stool softener uh, probably for the next week just to help with that first bowel movement. And so there's no straining. Recovery is stage seven. Um, pretty much on the first day, you'll probably get out of bed, take a few steps, sit in the chair. On day two, everything that's connected will be disconnected. You'll be eating, you know, on oral pain medication and possibly discharged. Um, it still surprises me when uh, patients are discharged the first day, donors are discharged the first day after surgery. Um, in, within a week, you probably only need uh, over-the-counter pain medication like acetaminophen, no driving for about two weeks, and back to work in about four to six weeks. Again, it's going to depend on the job and you know how strenuous it is or isn't. The last stage is future life with the with, without the kidney. Um, some people like to talk about donating, other people do not. Um, many describe it as a non-event. It's such a small aspect of your entire life. Um, you know, you have the surgery and then you kind of go back to feeling normal and you kind of forget about it as you day, go along day to day. There are some donors that have had minor complications and those are being tracked and followed by the transplant centers. Although the required follow-up is only at six weeks, I'm sorry, six weeks, six months, one year, and two years. Um, and that is an OPTN requirement, but there's no required follow-up after two years. So we're currently working on trying to get that improved so that we can track long-term uh, implications of donating better to give better information to donors before they donate. Um, and that follow-up often is just blood work to look at kidney function and, you know, kind of in general, do they have any complications? Um, are they still alive? Are they still doing okay? So now that we've reviewed the stages of living donation, let's go back and look at the different ways you can donate if you're interested. And again, these are things that not, um, not everyone is aware of. And so I think it's good um, as you're talking to your patients to help them understand there are uh, more than one option. Uh, directed donation is pretty much what everyone goes to initially. They know someone that needs a kidney and so they wanna donate to them directly. If they're not compatible with the person they want to donate to, uh, so in this example, donor one is not compatible with their intended recipient, recipient one, 
and there's another pair like them that are not compatible. So they're placed into a computer system and find that donor one is matched well with recipient two and donor two can give to recipient one. So you're probably pretty familiar with paired donation um, because we, we, we see that a lot with incompatible pairs. Uh, Non-directed donation is when you don't really care who your kidney goes to. Um, and that's the situation I had is when I first started the workup process, I did not have a recipient in mind and I just wanted to help anyone to get off dialysis to live a better life. Uh, donating to a stranger can also be called altruistic or good Samaritan. Next is a chain, which I would like to show you um, and just explain it in a little more detail. So remember, we have all these pairs that are incompatible and they're sitting in a computer program, you know, trying to find good matches. Well, donor one is matched with recipient two and two donor two is matched with recipient three. But here's, here's the deal. Donor one isn't going to give their kidney away until their intended recipient gets a kidney. So that's why chains are, it's a big deal when we find a non-directed donor who doesn't care who they donate to and they're compatible with the recipient and now the chain can continue and people can get transplanted that are part of this chain. Um, but that's why a non-directed donor can be so valuable and benefit the most number of people because it can, can kick off these chains. Okay, so moving into the next portion of the session, we have another polling question. Can you donate to someone who does not need a transplant right now, but they may in the future? This is a just a yes or no question. Again, not a test, just assessing your knowledge and where you are now. So I think it's important for anyone looking for a living donor and all potential donors to know about all the options. I just consider that being, having informed consent. But often I hear that donors are not told about other ways of donating if it's not provided at the transplant center they're at. And I'll give you an example. Uh, Kind of an example of that. So someone wants to do a directed donation and let's say they're not compatible and they're not really discussed or given the option of a paired exchange. Um, so let's see if those uh, polling results are up. And yes, so majority of you, 81%, um, are aware that there is the possibility of donating for someone in the future, great. So we're gonna dive deeper into that because giving someone a kidney now and helping someone get a kidney in the future can be done through voucher programs. So let me explain a little more about voucher donation. So in this example, we've got donor one, who wants to donate a kidney now to a stranger, which is recipient two. So because they did that, they can give a voucher to someone who potentially could need a kidney in the future. So this person now has a voucher and if they go into kidney failure later, they turn in the voucher, they'll be matched in that, again, that computer system with a donor and receive a kidney. Um, in my personal situation, I donated to a stranger and my husband who has uh, polycystic kidney disease, who had actually already had one transplant, he got a voucher. And my daughter who has PKD, who has normal kidney function, both got vouchers. And depending on the program, we'll see that um, you may be able to give a voucher to more than one person. Um, my husband later got a second transplant, but did not use the voucher because he found another living donor. So he still has one and my daughter still has one. Just a reminder though, only one person will ever be able to turn in that voucher 
for a kidney. So I like to categorize vouchers into short-term and long-term. So let's go over short-term first. So a recipient could get a kidney within one to five years. And an example could be a 58 year old male who wants to donate to his wife with kidney disease, but he is her caregiver and doesn't wanna have surgery at the same time. So he donates, has a voucher for her. After he recovers, she then um, can get a kidney. Or it could be a school teacher who wants to donate in the summer, but the recipient isn't ready. They're recovering from an illness, so it's not a good time for them. So they go ahead and donate, get a voucher, and then the other person um, who needs the kidney can get that transplant later. Um, before I go into long-term, I'm just going to mention that we can actually potentially get better matches with a bigger pool of people. And I'm gonna talk about registries in a little bit and how those can actually be very beneficial um, when you're doing a, a non-directed donation and using a voucher program. So long-term is when one of the intended recipients may get a kidney if and when they need one in the future, kind of an undetermined future. This could be healthy children, uh, if you need another transplant. And I think too often we don't talk about people who already have a transplant needing another one in the future. Um, so it's almost like even if you get a kidney, whether it's deceased or living donor, you should still start working on the need for another kidney and maybe talking to people about voucher options so that you can continue to get a voucher even for future kidneys. Um, you know, a lot of people are living longer and needing two and three transplants. Or it could be someone with known kidney disease who doesn't really need it now, but potentially could in the future, like, uh, like my daughter. Many donors um, can list the same person. So if you have multiple donors, they can list the same person on, on their voucher. Um, I haven't heard of any limitations of that. So for example, my daughter, if she had some friends that wanted to donate non-directed and give her vouchers, she could accumulate more than one voucher. Um, so how do you know which transplant centers participate in vouchers? So this is where kidney registries come in. Um, they're often used through vouchers. And this is not the same. A kidney registry isn't the same as the deceased donor transplant list. Sometimes those get confused in people's minds. Um, a lot of times the default is we're talking about deceased donors and the transplant waiting list. This is not that. This registry are for people who need a kidney and looking for a living donor. So the three major registries in the United States are UNOS, National Kidney Registry, or NKR, and the Alliance for Paired Kidney Donation, APKD. And transplant centers can pay money to participate in none, they don't have to participate in any, or one or two or all three. Um, I believe the more hospitals that participate in a registry, it offers the best chance of finding a better matched kidney. And hopefully that makes sense to you that the more people we have in this pool, rather than just the person in front of me, are we a good enough match? We could actually be getting a better match because there's a bigger resource of people to pull from to match donors and recipients. Um, even within transplant centers, they can do their own matching. Um, they don't have to go outside to a registry, but again, I feel it's much better to go to a registry because of the numbers of uh, donors and recipients that are there. And I think I said this, but a better matched kidney means the kidney should last longer. And isn't that really what we want for everyone? Um, the longest lasting kidney for that person. 
So looking very specifically at National Kidney Registry, NKR. Oh, wait, say something. Yes. So UNOS has no vouchers. So no one in the UNOS kidney pair donation. Now, this is not, again, I know it gets confusing. This is not the waiting list. This is the kidney pair donation registry. They do not have any vouchers. Um, if you look at the Alliance for Paired Kidney Donation, they require all of their transplant centers to use their voucher program. And then if you look at the National Kidney Registry, some of their centers use vouchers and some do not. Okay, now let's go on to NKR. So their short-term voucher is called a standard voucher. One person with kidney disease can be listed and they will likely need a transplant within one year. Their long-term option is called a family voucher. They can list up to five family members and they're kind of loose on their description of family. It could also be a close friend. And they do not have to have kidney disease. They can, but they don't have to. Um, so that's what I did. Although the rules have changed over the years, I was only allowed to list two people. Um, and I'm just going to say that was really difficult for me because I have a son also who we don't know if he has PKD and I was not able to list him because I could only list two people at that time. So how do you find which centers participate in NKR? If you go to kidneytransplantcenters.org and I'm going to show you that website. Um, you want to make sure you're on the donor tab. And then if you come here, there's lots of different pieces of information you can look at, but here specifically is the voucher program, and it will tell you which transplant centers participate in the voucher program through NKR. You can also find a center within so many miles. Um, that's another really nice way to search. You can also search by state and sort. All of these are sortable uh, tabs. Uh, you can do an alphabet sort. So it can give you a lot of information. But again, remember that these are National Kidney Registry centers, um, but it will help you find who participates in vouchers. Next, I'm gonna talk about the Alliance for Paired Kidney Donation. They call theirs the Kidney Pledge Program. They have a couple long-term, they call them the first one family. So it's any family member and it can even be future family members. So this one is very, very fascinating to me. Um, you sign the pledge as a donor, but you don't list any people. And at the time of need, the person is prioritized to get a kidney. And it also expires at the donor's death. So let's give you an example of that. So let's say um, my son um, has, I donate and, and I get a voucher. And later my son has a child who has kidney disease. It doesn't matter that they were born when I got the voucher, but if they progress later, they can turn it in as long as I'm alive. <laughs> so that one's very interesting. The next one is friend, pretty clear, up to five people. They don't currently have kidney disease. At the time of need, they're prioritized in the end of a chain. And it, this one expires at the death of the named person. And then their short term, they call advance. And it's one person with known kidney disease and they'll need a kidney within one to five years. And Elizabeth, do you have some information for them um, that can help them yes. sort Thank some you. of this out? Yes. So before we move on, I wanted, I'm going to put in the chat a link to a resource that I created. Um, this can be helpful for any of our participants. Excuse me, I think, let me stick to everyone here. This should be helpful to all the participants. I've included um, 
a summation of what she talked about here about the differences between the different registries and the different voucher programs. And then more specifically for those participants who are coming to us from within Network 5, so any facilities that are within Virginia, West Virginia, Maryland, or DC, I have um, broken down where all the transplant centers in our network, who they participate with and whether or not they're in the voucher program. Um, and there should be some links to the websites to help you as well. Um, Again, we know particularly um, social workers are kind of that first line of defense and information for a lot of our patients. Um, and as Glenna mentioned at the top, how important it is to get their stories out. And so if you can even help them walk through where makes the most sense, which uh, transplant center is gonna fit their needs best, um, best on uh, these options, we hope that that resource is helpful to you. Uh, and please feel free to reach out with any questions you might have. Thanks, Elizabeth. And I just wanna add that it's not really that easy to find this information. I mean, it's taken me years of being kind of in this donor space to talking to the different registries. Um, for example, the Alliance for Pair Kidney Donation, none of this information is on their website. Um, and I, you know, reached out to them and I said, please get it on your website. Please give me a, a handout, which Elizabeth will talk about later. But um, there's not always a lot of transparency. Um, they also wouldn't give me a list of their transplant centers that participate in the Alliance, which I found very frustrating also. Again, not a lot of transparency. It's not on their website. And um, there's no way to know unless you call or ask the transplant center. National Kidney Registry seems to be a little more transparent. At least I showed where you can find that information. Um, but I think it's a really good resource that Elizabeth has put together because she makes it kind of simplified in one document across all three registries. So hopefully, you know, take the time to take a look at that and see if that can be useful as you're talking to patients. So um, here are some questions that you could ask patients to find out their understanding and view on living kidney donation. Um, what have you been told about matching, about paired exchange, about non-directed donation? Um, I, I find a lot of people don't really know much at all about non-directed uh, or vouchers. Um, even the workup process, the surgery and recovery. I think sometimes we're so such a fear-based society that we're like, no, I don't want a living donor because it puts them at, you know, a risk, a very high risk. And I always say to people, um, even as I talk about donating, I'm not trying to force people to donate or encourage them to donate. I just want to give them options. And I trust that the transplant centers will, you know, use their policies, their expertise, their knowledge to figure out who are good donors and who are not good donors. That's not my job. That's not the recipient's job. That's the transplant center's job. It's not even your job as a social worker or a nurse in dialysis. You're just providing the information. And if people are curious, they can start the process and see how it goes. Like I mentioned, even up to the very time of surgery, they can back out. So at no point in time should they ever feel um, pressured to donate um, from, from anyone. And I laugh, I tell people, I couldn't force you to donate if I wanted to. <laughs> like, I don't have that much power. Um, so really, I just say, I trust the transplant center's processes. And if you're a good candidate, you are, and if you're not, it, it's not going to be an option, um, but it's not up to us to do the screening. It's up to the transplant center to figure out and the donor themselves if if they're interested in donating. Um, so these answers hopefully will guide your education and help you, um, you know, provide some more information that they may not be aware of. So I'm going to give this back to Elizabeth for our polling question number three. 
Yes, so time to round it out with our last polling question, similar to the one that we started out with. After this presentation, what is your comfort level with discussing the process and options for living donation? Comfortable, somewhat comfortable, not at all comfortable. Um, <clears throat> often patients don't know what to ask about living kidney donation. And so we feel, I think we've already mentioned this, by helping you understand the process, we hope it'll be easier for you then to discuss these issues with your patients and their families. And I and I do want to emphasize that I think it's important that the families, the caregivers, significant other children also have this information. Um, because again, I think sometimes if if the patient doesn't feel supported in exploring the idea of other living donors, um, it, it may not happen. So it really takes probably someone else who's kind of their advocate um, to help. And as we get into the next two sessions um, in um, that are coming up, we'll go into more detail about how um, you can assist and give them ideas for, for helping to talk about the living donation and looking a little more closely at how do we find a donor. And do we have the polling answers? Yes. All right, so I'm very pleased that not no one is now not at all comfortable. Yay. Um, so it's good to see the numbers coming up. And again, we've got two more sessions, so don't feel like uh, this is the end of the information yet. We still have some time to go and some um, topics to cover for the future. So thanks. Um, I hope you've gained some additional knowledge um, information, resources to help understand the donor workup process, um, even more about registries and vouchers. And I just appreciate the time you take out of your work day uh, to attend these sessions. And thank, thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm going to give it back to Elizabeth. Yes. Um, so as promised, there is now a time for some questions. Um, again, if you will put it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, it should be right next to the chat function. Um, we will take a look at things there. We already have one question. I'm not sure if this is a question or more of a comment. It's kind of exciting, though. It sounds like we have a living donor in the mix. Um, I didn't do a single 24-year in collection. I wonder why. So I can just tell you you've come up against an issue that we run into all the time because every transplant center is different and they have their own policies. So it's really hard sometimes to talk specifics because the centers can have different rules um, for what they do and how they do it. I'm, I'm wondering if you did have um, where they collected blood and urine and you were injected with some kind of a GFR marker. I wonder if they did that instead, which is probably more reliable and more accurate than a 24 urine. I, all, I already gave you my anxiety regarding the 24 urine, but when you're, you know, if you lose some urine, it's not gonna be as accurate. So there's a lot of discrepancies on whether the 24 urine is even a good tool to use. So I'm gonna guess that maybe you had another uh, test done to indicate what your GFR was. Um, I don't think you could have gotten through the process without a GFR measurement of some type, unless they just did the calculation based on regular blood and urine and did an eGFR potentially. Anything else? We have another question. Can a living donor start the workup before the intended recipient has been approved for transplant? Um, and I, I will qualify this by saying every transplant center is different, but this is why I like starting with those online questionnaires. So if you start with an online questionnaire, absolutely the answer is yes, because you don't even have to talk about who the recipient is at that point. Um, 
but there are centers that may not allow you to if the donor is not already, already worked up and on the deceased donor transplant list. Um, I'm always a little disheartened when, when they don't allow them to be worked up at the same time. But um, again, I kind of think there's a way around that by, by going on the website and getting questions and not even really um, worrying too much about who, who is going to get the kidney at that point. Let's just see if you're healthy enough and if you uh, can go through the workup process. Lena, is there an age limit for donating? So there's not a strict age limit, but again, every transplant center is different. So they could have a policy that restricts the age. Um, the health of the donor is what's much more important than the age of the donor. I will say as you as people are getting into their 60s and 70s, it's going to um, decrease the chances of their ability to donate. Uh, we do lose some kidney function as we age. And so we don't want to take a kidney if, if they already have a you know, a certain loss already that would put them at risk uh, for kidney failure later. Um, so I'm going to say no. I think the oldest one that I've heard of was in their 80s. Um, and sometimes they do, we do a lot more with age matching now with uh, donors and, and recipients. Um, so it could be if you're in your 60s or 70s, maybe they want to match you with a recipient that is a little older also, because they're not, not worried about how long that kidney would last uh, versus giving it to say a 20 year old. Um, next question. What happens if the intended recipient passes away before they're able to receive the transplant? So, most people do come in as a directed donor. They have a very specific person they want to donate to. Um, but if something happens to that donor, if they die, if they're no longer um, a good candidate to be a transplant recipient, the donor still has, as we discussed, other options if they're interested. So they could go in as a non-directed donor, donate to a stranger, um, which is especially nice if you've already gone through the whole workup and you're considered to be a good candidate to donate. Um, it would be really nice to be able to still help someone. And again, if, if you're in a program that offers vouchers, you could still help someone you know, a loved one, a family member. You know, a lot of our kidney diseases, um, some are hereditary. If you look at diabetes, polycystic kidney disease. So there could be a high likelihood that a, a child of that person or a grandchild of that person could need a kidney in the future. So the voucher just opens up a lot more options for um, the ability to donate and help someone, even if it's not who they initially wanted to donate to at the beginning. I want to I don't see any other questions this time. Um, keep putting the questions in the chat. We're going to um, talk about a few about next session and then the evaluation. And I'll keep my eye out for any other questions that come in. Um, so next session, this is giving life, exploring impact, benefits and considerations for living kidney donors. Um, so we've covered kind of the problem with kidney donation, the struggles that we've had. We've covered the ways to donate and the process for living donors. We've talked about the voucher program. Um, but of course, as people who are providing education to both patients and their family, we want to be really clear about, um, and as someone our, on our team often says, we don't want to be Pollyanna-ish about this. So we want to give balanced information about things they probably want to consider, as well as the benefits. And that's what we're going to do in our next session that will be in December. Um, we will include in our follow-up email a link for the registration. And I believe that we can also, yep, it's already in the chat. So if you want to just click on that and get registered, 
we can do that. That is going to be falling on December. Let me just make sure I got it right. Six. So another Wednesday, December 6th at noon. And then for the evaluation, this is how, if you are a social worker, that you can claim that credit. But for anybody else who is joining us, we really value your feedback. We want to bring you information that is helpful. Um, and so anything and feedback you can give us is really helpful. Uh, the link to the evaluation is in the chat. You can also utilize the QR code um, with your phone that is on the screen. Um, you're gonna get an email after this presentation is over with a lot of the links that we just talked about. Once you've successfully completed the evaluation, it'll take you right to the post-knowledge check. Um, and then there will be a link where you can complete and download and pr print your certificate of completion. Um, so just doing a last minute check for any other questions we might have. Well, I think that is all for us today. Um, just a reminder, take a look at the chat. We've got the registration and the evaluation, and we hope we see a lot of you back. Um, bring your friends in December. Thank you so much.